Okay, everyone, um, thank you much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our event on innovation and equality and sustainable development. Um, I have the pleasure of having two fantastic guests with us today. Um, Tice Hansen is a senior lecturer at Geography in Lund um, and was also a former regional and urban planning student, um, sadly, many years ago, Tice. Um, and his research focuses on the importance of spatial aspects of innovation processes for state sustainability transitions, transformative innovation policy, and the role of innovation in um, the bioeconomy. And he's going to talk to us today um, specifically about the role that the foundational economy can play in innovation and sustainable development. And we're also very fortunate to have John Tomney, who is a professor of planning at UCL. And his re um, research is principally concerned development of cities and regions as socioeconomic, political and cultural phenomena and the role of public policy in the management of these. And he's also worked on the foundational economy. So I think we're going to have a really good discussion today and a good debate. Uh, for those of you who haven't joined this before, we'll have our two speakers. They'll make some kind of short interventions. Um, and then we will have time for questions afterwards. So please do put your questions in the chat and we will answer as many of those as we can after the speakers have spoken. So I will pass over to Tice now to get us started. Thanks a lot, Nancy. And thanks a lot for the invitation to speak, even if somewhat disappointing that have to be virtually and not in person, but uh, very much appreciated though. So I hope you see the uh, slides now. Um, so today I'll talk on the, on the title of foundational economy and regional development. And I'll just start with outlining what I sort of would call the predominant focus in regional development research and practice, which I think is very much focused around improving the innovativeness of firms and systems. Now that focus has come with a, an emphasis on specific industries, pr primarily those that are R&D intensive and traded. So this quote here from a European Commission publication some years ago, I think quite nicely illustrates how these types of high tech industries um, are, are promoted based on this idea that R&D intensity is a goal in itself. And the policy should do what it can to make these kind of industries more important relative to the rest of the economy. Sort of the assumption underlying this is that uh, there are important multiplier effects that are, that, are, that are to be found in these industries, that they impact other industries because high tech industries have a high demand for business services and they also pay out high, high wages to the employees that they can go use in other, in other sectors. Now, importantly, these types of, this approach has also um, been, uh, been assumed to, to, to impact not just metropolitan high-tech areas, but also other uh, less developed regions through some kind of trickle-down effects. However, I would say that this approach to regional development has not convincingly addressed a number of core challenges that we face in regional development. And the first of these is, is focused on social polarization. Um, so there's actually quite little evidence that innovative high-tech regions are less deprived than more equal. So work of Neil Lee at the, at the department at LSE very clearly shows how innovate, innovation in European regions is actually positively related to inequality and how high-tech industry growth actually creates poorly paid service jobs in other industries. So this challenge of social polarization is still there. A second challenge which is, which is still there is that of inter-regional inequality. This highlights that certain European regions are characterized by persistent regional underdevelopment. So today, even the IMF sort of acknowledges that this is a problem, that these regional disparities are widening, meaning that people, the, the life chances, the life opportunities of people increasingly depend on, on where they happen to be born. So there is also still a need for rethinking research and policy on the development of less developed regions. And then finally, the third challenge that I want to highlight is that of environmental sustainability. 
So even though we have evidence that some regions, they manage to combine this innovation-led development model with greening of the environment, we actually have no systematic evidence that innovative regions are also greener. And of course, this is highly problematic given the urgency of tackling some of the core environmental challenges that we are facing today, climate change, but also very much around biodiversity crisis. So given these important and unresolved challenges, there's been recently substantial attention to rethinking economic development policy. And one of, I think, the most comprehensive approaches to doing this is possibly found in work on the foundational economy. So the foundational economy talks about these mundane services that provide us with uh, material and providential foundations. So they give us water, food, energy, but also uh, education, welfare services, elderly care. So the suggestion in this work is that these so-called welfare critical goods and services should take center stage in economic development efforts. So it's a big change, I would say, relative to sort of the, this predominant focus that we've seen so far. Now, the background for highlighting the importance of putting foundational sectors core on the policy agenda is also that there's been a widespread financialization of foundational services in the recent decades, which has led to an emphasis on short-termism and high return on investments, which actually fits very poorly with sort of the dynamics of these foundational services, in the sense that these are sectors that deliver stable but modest returns on investments over time. So this financialization has led to uh, salary reductions in foundational sectors, deteriorating working conditions, squeezing of suppliers, and also debt accumulation in order to allow for, uh, for paying out these, um, these, uh, these high returns on investments to shareholders. So in turn, leading to worsening conditions for those directly employed in these sectors, but also lower quality of provided services, which of course is something that matters to all of us. So the foundational economy suggests that social licenses can be a central intervention in dealing with this. So they are essentially social obligations that providers of foundational services, they have to uh, live up to in return for the right to operate in markets that are partly sheltered from competition. And they are suggested to be a way of securing social returns on these activities in the form of training, minimum wages, et cetera, and also including um, um, sort of ensuring sound financial practices of firms operating in these sectors. So the foundational economy is sort of a general approach to economic development, but it has specific implications at the regional scale. And primarily, this is due to the fact that the regional scale is central for organizing the delivery of foundational services, because they are either tied to physical infrastructures or to this need for human-to-human -human interaction. Also, regional cultures and identities, they influence conceptions of what actually constitute foundational services. So it's not so that what is considered foundational in one region is necessarily the same in another one. And because of that, it might be uh, advantageous to establish processes concerned with deciding on foundational priorities at the regional scale. And finally, it's also highlighted that local and regional experiments may play an important role in sort of developing this approach to policymaking in practice. So in the second part of, of this brief talk here, I'll simply consider this question here. So what are actually the opportunities and limitations of a foundational economy approach to regional development in addressing these core outstanding regional development challenges? So very briefly summarized, I think that there are many good reasons why a foundational economy approach to regional development could address the social polarization challenge because it changes the focus to industries that actually constitute the majority of employment, ensure that employees have decent working conditions, and they ensure the quality and affordability in these services, which are very important for all of us. But there's one point which I think is not very clear in this foundational economy thinking, and that is the role of innovation. So it seems that because a focus on innovation has in practice 
often resulted in an emphasis on high-tech industries, then it's considered of somewhat marginal importance to the foundational economy. However, there is no a, a sort of a priori conflict between foundational economy and what I would call a broad view of innovation. And this to me points to the importance of engaging with literatures on alternative modes of innovation, including public sector innovation, but also low tech innovation, which could provide a better understanding of the possibilities for improving the delivery of these services um, that matter for all of us. So what is then the promise of the foundational economy when it comes to addressing interregional inequality? Well, as mentioned before, sort of the regional scale is really important um, because it's central to organizing the delivery of these foundational services because they're tied to these physical infrastructures or the need for you know, being able to be in front of other people. So because of that, foundational services are geographically distributed and foundational employment is actually particularly important in less developed regions. So in this sense, foundational economy arguably provides an improved starting point for thinking about embedded regional development policies in less developed regions. I wanted to share with you some recent work we've been doing on priority setting at the level of municipalities in Denmark. So we've been analyzing uh, strategic planning documents for all the 98 Danish municipalities to understand the extent to which they give priority to foundational sectors or rather export oriented sectors. So Danish municipalities, they have the formal responsibility um, for delivery of many foundational services. So we kind of assume that they would take center stage in these strategic documents. And indeed that is also the case. So 78% of all the Danish municipalities, they give main or exclusive attention to foundational sectors in their strategies. However, what we also find is that it's actually particularly metropolitan areas, um, municipalities in, in metropolitan areas that give priority to foundational economy. So rural municipalities are much less likely to emphasize these sectors. So following this sort of general mapping of priorities, we also made a comparative analysis of two rural municipalities. And that basically suggested that foundational priorities are put central on the agenda in the absence of other options. And furthermore, the focus on foundational priorities is rolled back in times of crisis because it's considered that it will sort of send the wrong signal that municipalities cannot afford to prioritize foundational industries in times of hardship. So the main conclusion is that even though it's actually quite high on the agenda, many places, it's still not really considered the real foundation for economic development, but rather something that municipalities can afford to prioritize when the economy is growing. Now, considering a bit more critically whether foundational economy can constitute a future development model for lagging regions, I would first of all argue that there is a need for greater consideration for development around digitization. So if you go to a high school in the north of Sweden today, there's a great chance that you will find a classroom looking like this. So what we're seeing is a very speedy development towards distance provision of providential services in many peripheral areas, at least in the Nordics. On the positive side, this of course sort of provides possibilities for providing a broader range of services to peripheries. However, there's also a risk of uh, employment in these industries actually moving out of these uh, out of these peripheral areas, right? So we'll see a spatial concentration of production and employment of foundational services in urban centers. So I think. In summary, there is an important question on the implications of digitization for the ability of the foundational economy approach to address interregional inequality. A second critical point on this topic is concerned with the ability to actually govern the foundational economy. So as noted in this foundational economy manifesto here, this is tricky stuff, yeah? And there's a need for empowering and upskilling regional governments. However, I'm somewhat skeptical to the suggestion that the answer to this challenge is necessarily decentralization. So 
First of all, we know that quality of government is a central predictor for level of development. And secondly, we also know that the effects of decentralization are significantly conditioned by government quality. So if we decentralize authority and resources to poorly functioning governments, then it has negative effects for these regions. So I think the conclusion here is that for the foundational economy to constitute a coherent approach to regional development in lacking regions, there is also a need for greater consideration for developing the institutional capacity in these regions. So finally, there's a third challenge of environmental sustainability, which has received somewhat limited attention in most work on the foundational economy, and as illustrated in, in some of the quotes here. However, I wonder if this lack of attention is also a result of sort of a missing recognition of possible trade-offs between social and environmental aspects, as illustrated by the writings on the yellow vest here of a French protester, which basically says less taxes, more purchasing power. We want to live, not survive. This point is closely connected to the question of how foundational priorities are established. So the suggestion in the foundational economy literature is that the blindingly obvious starting point is to ask citizens what they want. Now, unfortunately, it turns out that citizens, for example, are much more eager to own a car than to subsidize public transport. And this is unfortunately not really surprising if you go to the literature on environmental psychology, which has provided quite detailed insights on the multiple barriers that are found at the individual level that prevent uh, in, um, pro-environmental behavior, including factors such as perceived uh, distance to environmental problems in time and space, or simply personal preference against pro-environmental behavior. So to conclude, what are then the promises of the foundational economy approach when it comes to addressing these central regional development challenges? Well, my reading is that it's very promising in dealing with social polarization, but there are question marks around its ability to support the development of lacking regions, and in particular in dealing with environmental sustainability. So in the latter point, it is perhaps not blinding the obvious that foundational priorities should be established by asking citizens what they want. And I think this points to the importance of thinking about trade-offs between social and environmental priorities and questions around hierarchies or needs, which are topics that are very rarely considered when we talk about regional development. But maybe we'll need to do that more in the future. So with that, thank you for your time and attention and thank you to the funders um, make thinking about these types of questions possible. Um, okay, back to you, Nancy. Thank you very much, Thijs. Um, I'll let you, there we go. All right, I think what we'll do is um, head over to John now um, to let him give his presentation and we're collecting some good questions on the chat. So we'll be able to answer those in a moment. Um, John, can I pass over to you? You're John, unmute. I'll just uh, try and share my slides here. Can we all see that? Okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, and Nancy and uh, colleagues at LSE for the invitation and to Tease for uh, setting up uh, this discussion are, uh, on the usefulness of the foundational economy. Um, I want to examine um, some of the themes which Tees has already touched upon through the lens of uh, left behind places. I put this term in quotation marks it's, uh, because it, it carries a lot of baggage, um, but it's certainly in, in the UK, it's the term which has been used to describe the places which are on the um, uh, you know, which are the victims of these processes of polarization and interregional inequality that uh, Tees was talking about. But well, they exist in many places. Uh, they exist in the Rust Belt in the US. We saw the example of the Gilets Jaunes uh, in, uh, in Tees' presentation. So I'm interested in these places. Um, and um, first of all, understanding the limitations of dominant theoretical uh, frameworks for uh, from the perspective of understanding left behind places. Tisa's covered a lot of this ground, so I'll, I'll not dwell on it. Um, 
what I uh, want to uh, emphasize is though that, you know, essentially um, what we have is a perspective which is founded on a narrow conception of the economy as economic growth, uh, which uh, uh, Thies has already mentioned, um, fixated on the tradable or competitive sector of the economy, focused on the economically dynamic and prosperous cities and regions, and even within those regions, a kind of city centrism, as my co-author Andy Pikes called it, the idea that city centers are the principal motors of economic growth and productivity, um, leaving the economic potential uh, of lagging and declining uh, regions overlooked in dominant narratives. Um, there may be a shift taking place, uh, certainly in the UK and perhaps across the, uh, uh, the global north, in thinking around all of this, the populist backlash against global capitalism, liberal democracy has been heavily concentrated in these left behind places. And that's stimulating uh, uh, a new interest in these places, although not necessarily uh, much policy innovation in how we deal with them. And I'll come on to talk about that. Um, Again, Thies has kind of covered a lot of this ground as to what we mean by the foundational economy. Um, we know about the tradable economy, um, uh, those aspects of the economy which are the most innovative and um, uh, which are uh, more ex most exposed to market competition. The foundational economy asks us to think about the daily essentials that are provided through infrastructure networks. Um, provide the, the basics of life, if you like. Um, this is a sector which was traditionally low risk, low, low risk and low return, um, providing long time planning horizons for public and private providers, but has been financialized and privatized uh, in recent times. And it's in this zone that um, I think there's a great deal of potential for, for rethinking uh, how we approach the problems of, of left behind places. Um, so what's missing then um, in this, um, uh, that we need, what, what are the missing aspects of, a, of an explanation, analysis and policy regime, if you like, for left behind places? Well, um, working with uh, colleagues at UCL, particularly uh, Florence Hutcliffe Braithwaite and Lucy Natarajan and colleagues at Newcastle University in Kurds, um, I'm going to draw on some um, thinking that we've been doing in some uh, papers that are uh, in development and some projects which are underway, which are um, addressing some of the, what we see as the missing components. Uh, and one important missing component, and this speaks to a point that Thies made about regional cultures affecting how the foundational economy is uh, defined and understood. What we're particularly concerned with is the more than economic characteristics of places that are left behind. We're particularly interested in the question of what connects place, uh, people to these places and why that's un, uh, important for understanding um, uh, their development. Now, in a sense, we are taking seriously the, the suggestion that we should ask people in these communities what it is they, um, uh, what it is they want. Thies was urging caution around that question, but we uh, uh, think this is important and a place sensitive approach must be founded on uh, what people understand is, as their needs and wants in terms of the foundational economy. And in particular, we're, uh, we're, we want to foreground the significance of place attachment to development. One of the um, uh, interesting features of these left behind places is the fact that they do reproduce themselves even in conditions of extreme economic stress in times. Um, and what this points to, in, in, and to some extent, Thies was hinting at this in some of his remarks, what this points to is complex relationships between economy, society, culture and politics at different spatial scales. Um, and in particular, what we're interested in is the relationship between place attachment uh, and belonging. And in particular, uh, the way in which social infrastructures uh, provide the space uh, for, um, uh, for these issues to be addressed. Um, so what are we talking about here? Let's define some terms. We're talking about the extent to which a sense of place shapes patterns of development. By this we mean the effective bonds between people and environment. Um, and I'll come on to explain why I think this is important through a study of a village that we've been doing in the north of England. Um, 
we are here also talking about the moral particularities of place as, as political philosophers would have it. That's to say the way in which regional cultures uh, affect the, the understanding that people have about what's important and not in terms of economic development. We've drawn, we, we draw as well on attachment theory, um, particularly the way it's been applied to places, but that, that of course uh, is a fundamental concept within psychology. And um, in particular, attachment theory uh, helps us understand processes of loss and grief. Uh, and these seem to be uh, particularly useful in understanding what happens to places that have lost their traditional industries and been left behind by the economic processes that have uh, accelerated over the last 30 or 40 years. So for instance, a really interesting study by Deborah Mattinson recently um, on uh, of political attitudes in left behind places in, in, in England talks about uh, the town of Stoke-on-Trent and the intense sense of belonging that disaffected voters have in this place. This was the centre of the uh, pottery industry in Britain. And she talks about this tradition whereby people in, uh, from Stoke would, whenever they went away from the city uh, and went out for a meal, would first of all tip over the plate to see whether the plate had been made in Stoke, symbolising this intensity of uh, bonds between them and their place. And the question arises, what happens when your pottery, in, pottery industry grows? What happens to your sense of identity and self? Um, and more recently, there's been a, a set of uh, uh, contributions uh, from people such as Andy Haldane, the chief economist at the Bank of England, who's argued that um, we have neglected uh, the role of social infrastructures in underpinning uh, well-functioning places. Um, and uh, while we talk a lot about infrastructure and the role of infrastructure in, in the promotion of economic development, and we see this in the UK at the moment, there's a, an agenda of levelling up, addressing the problems of these uh, left behind places. Much of it is about big infrastructure, fast railway lines, free ports and so on. But these micro social infrastructures are extremely important, particularly in these left behind places. And uh, these form a component, I would argue, of the foundational economy. So, for instance, a recent survey by Servation of uh, people, of attitudes in left behind places, asked people uh, if their area was to get, uh, uh, as a result of uh, less resources coming to their area, what, what, um, what activities do you feel that, that, that your, your place is missing out on? And interestingly, it's places to meet which comes top of the list. So these sort of intangible social infrastructures which underpin a sense of belonging uh, seem uh, to be very important, yet these kinds of infrastructures are not really seen as uh, uh, key to economic development, but in left behind places, as I say, they form a component of that foundational economy. Um, so we've been exploring these ideas through what we're calling a, a deep place engagement with a village in, in, in County Durham. This village is called Sacriston. It's uh, near Durham City, um, about three or four miles from Durham, Durham City. It's a former coal mining town. Uh, this is how it looked in about 19, uh, well, in about 1914, which was the peak of the coal production of the Durham coal field. Um, it was organized around uh, a mine, which was the tradable sector of the local economy, and to some extent from which uh, uh, resources could be uh, uh, creamed to support investments in social infrastructure in this village. And this is a tiny village of uh, four, 5,000 people. Um, which has lost population in, uh, over a long period, but has gained a little bit of population in recent times. But it was rich in this social infrastructure for most of its history until really uh, recent decades. Um, it's a very uh, uh, ordinary place. Uh, it doesn't look dramatic. It doesn't feel dramatic uh, when you go through it. Although, as you can see here, it looks rather nice in, in this picture uh, of a snowy day a couple of years ago. Um, What's, what's a striking feature of this village is, is the very strong sense of belonging um, that, you, uh, that, that, that is revealed by the work that we've done, particularly focus groups uh, in, in the village and also oral histories. Um, this sense of belonging is, uh, is emphasized, for instance, by Martin Sandu in his um, recent book, The Economics of Belonging. He argues that uh, what characterizes the left behind place is, the, is their sense that they don't belong to the economy. But there's a very powerful sense of belonging within this place and a very particular uh, vernacular 
uh, understanding of it and, 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 a di and an entire dialectical way uh, of speaking about it um, in the local uh, in the local patois, if you like. So we're interested in um, this uh, this phenomenon of belongingment, and if we consider the history of the village, and this goes back to 1914 again, the, the, the high point, if you like, of the uh, productive capacity of the Durham coal field, what you uh, understand is the richness of this social infrastructure, much of it um, based around um, the building of uh, religious uh, facilities of one kind or another, which played a huge role um, in the promotion of uh, village life. Um, so this is uh, this was a place which was didn't really exist in 1850, but by 1914 had become uh, uh, rich in this uh, social infrastructure. And one expression of this uh, infrastructure, uh, of this sense of belonging, still today is the Durham Miners Gala, um, which is this gathering of all the villages in County Durham once a year in July. Uh, not last year because of COVID, but uh, for 150 years or so. Uh, this great gathering of uh, bands and banners representing each of the villages. Um, and uh, the, the great North uh, Durham, County Durham writer Sid Chaplin, who who's began his life as a miner, talks about how um, what these banners represent is a village and a kind of what he calls a do-it-yourself counter environment. These villages were self-constructed. So in, in the village of Sacriston, for instance, the, uh, the Catholic church there was built via subscriptions from local Catholics who commissioned their own architect, uh, one of the great ecclesiastical architects of the 19th century and built their own church. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is what's formed this sense of belonging. It's not so much the work, uh, the work was important, but around the, the work, this kind of communal um, enterprise, if you like. And it's still important today. So each miners gala, uh, although the pit uh, closed in 1985, every year the village uh, banner group, as they're called now, uh, parades its banner through the uh, centre of Durham and 100,000 people turn up to participate in this spectacular manifestation of local identity and belonging. Um, so what's left of all of this? Well, one of the great pieces of infrastructure which was built around about that period that I talked about of 1914 was the village co-op, um, which until recently has looked like this, redundant, abandoned, co-op is gone from the village. Um, but uh, community organization is now being formed, uh, taken over control of this building um, and is recycling it uh, to, it, to create new uh, social infrastructure, space for social enterprises, uh, space for meeting and so on. But the story which emerges from this is about the difficulties that exist in, in making this happen, uh, despite uh, the desire and enterprise uh, in the village. So this provides an example of this kind of micro social infrastructure, uh, which speaks to the needs of the, uh, of the village, um, but which turns out to be very difficult uh, to, uh, to, to introduce in practice. So um, that's, my, um, uh, that's my observations on, um, on these issues. And I hope that they've added something to what Thies has, uh, has suggested. Um, so it's in this zone of micro infrastructures that support um, communal life, where I think there's a great uh, gap uh, in um, the urban and regional studies um, and uh, where we plan to do uh, more work along the lines that I've discussed. Thank you both very much. That's really, I think they're very complimentary presentations and really very interesting. I think we've got one question that um, from the floor that actually really kind of speaks to all of this. Um, and the question is, uh, how can municipalities be incentivized to practice um, and to cooperate on strengthening the foundational economy? So how, how can this be put into practice? And my question on that as well, would it be, um, the municipality level that would be the most important or what scale of government should this happen at? Um, and I think both of you, if you could answer that would be brilliant. And whoever wants to go first can jump in. Well, I can go. Yeah, you got um, it. So it's a good question. I mean, in a sense, I think that this might be less challenging for, for foundational sectors in the sense that municipalities do not really 
compete when it comes to these industries to the same extent they might be competing over exporting industries. Um, so I think what we see in, in Denmark is that there is the part of that approach is reactive in the sense that municipalities become sort of forced to do it when resources are scarce. So we see in some places a division of labor where you know, different neighboring municipalities, they start to focus on different foundational activities to simply make sure that in sort of the broader region that the different, the different uh, services are still being delivered. But of course, there's also an opportunity for taking a more proactive approach to that um, in the sense that I think that there, there, there could be good ways of trying to institutionalize um, collaboration between municipalities. Um, and maybe that needs to sort of not necessarily always come from the bottom, but also be, uh, be something that can come from, from the regional or the national level that, that you actually think about these opportunities for uh, collaboration across municipalities, uh, rather than always thinking that each municipality on its own has to, has to deliver all the measures. Um, I was struck by uh, some of the data in Tisha's paper, which suggested that um, uh, metro authorities, metro municipalities in Denmark were more inclined to be making investments as it were in the, uh, in, in the development of the foundational economy than rural areas were. And you pointed, you, you sort of suggested that uh, we have to be aware of the unevenness of the capacities that exist uh, at the municipal scale. Um, and I would say that particularly in some left behind areas, the capacity of local authorities, particularly in the UK as a result of a long period of austerity, but preceding that, as well, because of an absence of, uh, um, I think, in capacity around these issues, uh, limits the extent to which they they get this argument. Um, so municipalities will undoubtedly play a key role um, in in promoting the, uh, the foundational economy, uh, particularly in left behind places, because mm -hmm. they do have some resources, some authority, some legal powers, and so on. But I'm quite taken um, by arguments which are being put forward at the moment, certainly in the UK and in, and in other uh, parts of the world, um, which concern how you empower communities themselves beyond the municipality to take a lead in some of these processes. Now, if you look at some of the data which we have about left behind places, you know, in the local authorities are, in those places are often seen as part of the problem, not the solution by voters. Mm. Uh, and that's a really big issue. Um, uh, so organizations like New Local in the UK have proposed this notion of a community paradigm. This doesn't mean that we, uh, you know, we abandon local authorities, but that local authorities play a big role in enabling community actors themselves uh, to, to uh, uh, bring forward solutions. And I think in our village, um, that is precisely what you're seeing. You're seeing uh, coming together of an organization to take over this important piece of infrastructure in the center of the village, which was once extremely important and provided valuable basic services, uh, owned, mutually owned at the time. Um, uh, and they, they, they want to bring that back to life in ways which um, provide space for social enterprises, so furniture, upcycling and recycling business, a uh, community cafe, which is really lacking in the village, these sorts of things. And they the blockages which exist to that happening uh, are quite remarkable, really. The, the, the funding streams don't exist. The, um, uh, the, the, the bureaucratic space uh, um, for ongoing revenue support doesn't exist. You can get money for capital, but you can't get money for revenue support for these kinds of activities. All of these things uh, prevent uh, uh, enterprise taking place in, in these places. And, um, the, the assumption is that they, you know, these are not enterprising places because that's revealed in terms of their uh, social and economic statistics, but there's a lot of enterprise going on against all massive odds in these places. So we need um, a, a, a form of municipalism that enables uh, this kind of activity to take place and provides a supportive environment. Um, and some of the resources to do that, I think maybe we'll, we'll have to stand outside of the local authority um, community infrastructure funds and these kinds of ideas um, in which the local authority may be uh, overseeing them but not controlling them um, in order to enable these spaces to uh, to, to uh, develop and grow 
um, because there's great potential there, which is untapped at the moment. Just add that I think also what we see in Denmark is that a lot of, a lot of the funds coming from experimenting with novel solutions uh, for these types of services is actually coming not from the public sphere, but from philanthropy. Um, and uh, well, that's of course good, but it also means, of course, that it's outside of democratic control. Right? Um, and there are other questions, uh, issues around that, of course. Yeah. Okay, we have another question from the floor. Um, and this is talking about um, kind of looking at these uh, left behind places in other contexts. And um, Will Howard asks, um, there are similar conversations in the US regarding the left behind places like Appalachia and the Rust Belt, um, where homo economicus is considered to be mobile to seek other opportunities, but that that isn't happening um, in these places. And he wants to know, is this a recent trend? Is this a reaction to modernized globalized economy or is, are things just getting a bit more focused now? Um, I'll have a go in yeah. <laughs> answering that one. Um, yeah, if, I think that, that you, you, you're correct. There are some similar um, conversations taking place um, in the US. I mean, we have some relations with the, the Lincoln Institute and its work on legacy cities. And I, I see the I see lots of echoes in that kind of work with um, some of the debates that are taking uh, place in the UK. I mean, traditionally, of course, the US has been a much more mobile society than um, European countries. Um, uh, but I, I guess there's now a genre of literature, is there not? Um, Hillbilly Elegy and a whole range of these, uh, they're all on the shelf behind me, actually, uh, uh, which, which point to the, um, uh, that the immobility, the, the increasing immobility of at least certain groups in the United States. Now, partly that's um, uh, as a result of the inability to move to where the opportunities are because the costs of doing that are, are very high the unaffordability of moving to the uh, superstar cities. I mean, Florida's written about, what, you know, his discovery in 2018 of the, um, uh, the uh, you know, the, the, the barriers to entry, if you like, into the labor markets of the superstar cities. But, I, but my, my, my um, belief is, and I think there's evidence to support this, and it, and it comes from the, um, some of the work that we're doing in our village, is that uh, as well as these sort of factors preventing people from moving, there are factors which keep people in these villages, and these are to do with the social networks, the, um, uh, uh, the family support structures and so on, uh, which are very, very valuable, um, to, 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 although very difficult to measure very impossible to put a price on but which uh, are part of the formation of attitudes in those places and give them as I said a kind of moral particularity um, so I think certainly in uh, you know Christophe Gouy has written a little bit about this I know his you know not everybody's a massive fan of his work on in, in France among my academic colleagues but he's written about um, uh, this how this plays a factor in uh, rural France um, and how um, it is also a kind of source of social capital, um, which underpins the kind of initiatives that we see in Sacristan, the, 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 uh, the, the, the effort to save the co-op. We can find examples of this all over the UK, all over France, um, parts of Eastern Germany and so on, um, where there's um, uh, uh, efforts to, to sort of hang on to and, and rebuild social infrastructure. Yet municipal authorities and national governments remain convinced that you know it's new motorways high-speed railway stations uh, these are the solutions uh, to the problems of these places but they're solutions we've been trying for 30 or 40 years now or, or perhaps even longer in, in, in parts of the uk uh, and they haven't altered the kind of inequalities that uh, Tees was talking about um, so i think these places play out differently in different countries because of different national identities cultures uh, state uh, uh, government governance systems and so on, um, but there are common problems across uh, all of these uh, places, and there's a lot to be learned from sharing knowledge and understanding on these things. I, I would suggest. If you don't mind my jumping in here for just a second, and then Tice, you can come back as well. 
Um, all of this really reminds me of um, both UK and US policy of the 1960s when we suddenly rediscovered poverty, mm -hmm. uh, which always I find kind of amusing that, you know, I think of some bureaucrat kind of walking down a street and going, oh, dear God, there's poverty um, because he's never noticed before. Um, but the problem seems to be that we always describe the places where economic decline is happening as the problem. Mm. And so we direct efforts in terms of um, trying to fix the people in the places rather than actually trying to understand that the problem might be more structural or the problem might actually be with superstar cities that attract a lot of wealth and drain a lot of wealth out of other places. So I'm wondering, um, does the foundational economy have a kind of a part to play in evening all of this out so that we're not always looking at places like Appalachia as the problem or, or Durham as the problem, but that we're looking at um, perhaps those flows of funds that go into other places as the problem overall. Yeah, good, good point. Um, you, you correct that, you know, scarcely anything we talk about is, is really new. We're always reinventing all debates and, uh, and concepts and so on. I mean, thinking about the UK in the 1970s, for instance, um, when urban poverty um, and left behind places, as it were, started to uh, emerge, the UK government set up in several places things called community development projects. And they were, you know, you, you'll know about these, Nancy, but the idea was to study why have these places become poor? What's wrong with the people in these places that keeps them poor? This kind of pathological understanding of the problem. And um, they set up all these community development projects and uh, recruited researchers. And the researchers said, there's nothing to do with these places, to do with the structural nature of the economy. Right? So we just, it's a recurring uh, uh, debate in that sense. Um, and I agree that, you know, the superstar cities, um, their, their apparent productivity rests a lot on their ability to extract wealth from the economy rather than to produce it. I agree, you know, I strongly agree with that. So the problems of left behind places uh, will require, to, to solve, will require money and the money exists in other places, not, it's, it's concentrated, the wealth in, is, is in other places. So we, we, you know, part of the solution to the, the problems of these places is going to involve you know, not grants to, to do up the co-op, but changes in the taxation system, wealth taxes, land value taxes, these kinds of the, the taxes, which um, return some of that extracted wealth back to the places where it's needed. And um, we may also be in, in doing that, solving some of the problems of uh, the superstar cities and the um, the problems of uh, affordability and, and, and so on, which um, are undermining their, their, their ability now. So you, you're right. I mean, and I think that's part of what Tis was asking us to think about the interregional uh, nature of the problems, not to focus simply on the pathology. But then once you've done that, what could you do in those places that would make a difference to the lives of people? Um, you know, in, in the UK, leveling up debates, you know, building a high speed rail line between London and Manchester isn't going to help these places. Um, you know, there may be good reasons for doing it. For building a high-speed rail line but it's not going to help mining you know former mining villages seaside towns mill towns and so on um what do you do in those places and, and what can you help people to do for themselves it seems to me the uh the key key issue i completely agree i would just add i think that this this question about mobility and the um, ability to to move it also it also brings sort of an interesting uh, um, perspective on what is actually the policy problem that we are trying to address here, right? So I think very often, if you go to uh, to uh, to uh, to urban economists, they will say that, well, I mean, what is really the policy problem here is that you know people are not moving when they sort of they they uh, they ought to be right. So I'm thinking about people like Enrico Moretti, who wrote this, the new geography of jobs some years ago, right? Suggesting that well, important policies uh, priorities should be to make these people move, right? So we should get, hand out mobility checks and uh, teach them how to move, etc. Right? Um, I'm just thinking, you know, they're, they're they're very different eyes on what is actually the problem where I think many geographers would say, well, it's not about, you know, making people 
able to actually leave their places. It's about changing the places that they live in, in a way that makes them more attractive. And here I think that foundational thinking has a lot to offer um, in making sure that these foundational services are actually um, accessible um, affordable and of uh, sufficient quality also when we talk about the lagging regions. And then another thing that um, I'm curious about, and it comes from a tweet that I saw, um, John, you did um, a few days ago about the foundational economy and, and how important it was um, to the economy overall in the times of something like COVID. And I'm wondering as well, Tice, because you guys have had a slightly different um, experience, if I'm not mistaken, in Denmark. Um, but the point was that these are industries that have to operate and therefore are industries that uh, we should actually be focusing on. So rather than retail, which we realize now could be very vulnerable and the service economy, which could be very vulnerable, perhaps we should be redirecting our efforts and attention to some of these more essential industries. No, completely agree. Um, and I mean, so in Denmark, well, we we have quite high high figures now. So I think that we are not uh, we're not we're not completely out of uh, <laughs> out of problems. Also, when it comes to COVID, but we've also had debates here because it turns out that uh, Danish uh, public uh, authority in terms in in charge of vaccinations, etc. They sold a bigger they they sold the vaccine production facilities. Uh, to foreign investors some years ago, right? And that turns out to be a point of critique now, which no one thinks about when you're not in a crisis, right? So, I mean, definitely, definitely true that once you're in a crisis and you sort of uh, have to focus on, on the things that get you through the everyday, well, obviously, policy attention to foundational sectors is something that I think is, <laughs> is on the minds of everybody, yeah, without question. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, observing COVID through the lens of this, you know, village, which by most measures is extremely disadvantaged, is, is really interesting. So we had a, an interesting discussion with a head teacher from a local primary school. She's originally from the village, and that's a very unusual situation that she's from the village and is head teacher of the primary school, but she lives in a nearby village now, a much uh, swankier uh, village. Uh, and she was comparing and contrasting the way in which the villagers had responded to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. So in her sort of upmarket uh, village uh, just outside Durham, uh, she said there was no communal response to the uh, crisis. Whereas in the mining village, she said it, it just kicked in. She said it was an instinct that in a crisis, this place knew how to come together because uh, mining was always a dangerous occupation and uh, there's a, she, she argued there's a kind of DNA in the community so they immediately form a food bank they immediately uh, start distributing food the cricket club offers its services as a place to make to have the food bank and, and all of this all of this happens she said naturally and instinctively um, and this is very powerful uh, social capital and it's a very powerful effort to fill in gaps in the foundational economy which uh, have been lost um, uh, from the past and it's part it, it contributes partly to remaking the identity of the village as a place which despite all of its problems is self-reliant and that goes really far back into the history of, 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 the, of this village um, you know uh, this this idea that it was a self-reliant place is very strong and in a sense when we when I muted myself accidentally there. Um, my, my, when, when, I, um, uh, when you go back into the history of the village, it's this sense of a self-reliant place that people feel has been lost, a vibrancy and a self-reliance that's been lost. And how, so the question then becomes, how do you create the uh, uh, conditions under which uh, that could be rebuilt in some way or other? And the COVID crisis is, is really demonstrated um, uh, the coming together of a village to do that and fill in these gaps. I do think it's always very interesting. These are exactly the sorts of things governments 
spend quite a bit of money on in terms of let's create social capital um, without ever actually looking at places where that social capital exists and trying to do something with that. Um, we are coming close to our time. I'm wondering if either of you would like to have kind of a minute to just sum up your kind of main point that you'd like to take away from the event and the talk. Um, Tice, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so I think my reflection on this is that, well, obviously, sort of the overall conclusion is that uh, taking a foundational economy approach to, uh, to to regional development is not it's not a it's not a silver bullet that on its own is going to take care of all the different problems. Um, but on the other hand, there uh, I think there are very important elements here. And you should also, we should also remember that what we are comparing it against is not whether it can fix everything at once, but whether it might actually improve uh, relative to what is already there. Yeah? And uh, with those classes on, I do think that, uh, that there is a very good argument for trying to, for trying to elaborate on this. Yeah? And there are other that uh, sort of literatures out there that can help with addressing some of the weaknesses or some of the blind spots that are still there in, in the foundation economy approach. I agree with uh, uh, with Tish there that this what what the foundational econ the, the foundational economy perspective doesn't provide all the answers to how we address the issues that Tish raised at, the, raised at the beginning, or from a practical point of view, what you do in a village like Sacriston. Um, but what it does is asks it, it asks a set of different a different set of questions to the to the economic orthodoxy, and I think that they're very illuminating uh, questions. There are lots of other interesting ideas out there. Some of my colleagues at UCL talk about universal basic services. I think there's something in in, in all of that. Um, I've been converted a little bit to, in the direction of universal basic income uh, in the current crisis. I, after being very skeptical about it, I could I can see how. You know some some more of the, some more of the merits of it. So there's, there are a lot there are several interesting ideas out there. Community wealth building is, is is another one. All of them have their strengths and weaknesses. All of them have their gaps. But the foundational economy approach, I think, is particularly useful for uh, getting us to think about the economy in in, in a different way, um, and potentially it leads us in different policy directions. I, you know, Tisa's is right to identify some of the gaps um, in, in in that thinking and and where we might look to fill them. Um, and I think as well, we need to think about the more effective dimensions of economic life. You know, this the extent to which people's lives are focused around where they belong. Uh, the search for belonging, I think, is is one of the great, um, you know, it's something of it's something in our in, in our particular moment, um, people are searching to, for ways to belong, and they need help in order to understand how that how to do that in a world of mobility and and and, and a very fluid the very fluid times we live in, but there's something there that needs uh, needs to be addressed. Brilliant. OK, so it's we're right on time um, and it leaves me to thank both um, Tyson and John for coming along and speaking with us. I think it's been a really fascinating topic. Um, we'll get this up um, as a recording on Facebook so we can pass it around if um, we want. Um, this is our last event um, for the moment. Uh, we will be doing some podcasts coming next term um, and hopefully a couple of more of these events because I think they've been really very good and um, really very exciting. Uh, so I will leave it there. Thank the audience and thank um, our speakers and the people behind the scenes that are making all this work because for sure I would not know how. Um, so thank you for technical and smart people other than me. Um, all right. Thanks very much, guys. Bye. Thank you.